better tech, better living. Uh, we're broadcasting this on a Friday afternoon, long weekend, where Amy and I have already started our vacations and thought it would be fun to share a few fun home hacks or, for the real lazy, some super home slacks. If you have any that you'd like to share in the comments, uh, definitely please do that. We will probably not get to our list and we'll have another show. But what we wanted to do was just cover some of those things that are just so easy, they can't possibly work. And to kick things off, I want to uh, start off with our very favorite dishwasher. And we're not gonna use any spouse jokes here about uh -huh. being your favorite dishwasher. <laughs> But when you think about it, think about the amount of time it takes you to unload and push, put things away. And one of the simplest hacks is simply understanding where the effort comes in. When you're putting items into the dishwasher, you're putting them in one at a time. But when you're taking things out, you're doing the whole dishwasher at once. So I'm gonna bring up a few pictures from time to time. And so pause, bear with me as I scroll a doodle here. And so the first thing is, if you put items into your dishwasher next to where they're going to be, so put like items, like, like items, there's no extra effort when you're loading the dishwasher, but then you can literally grab hands fulls of things and put them right away. So in this example, in the silverware, all the like forks are together, the cutting knives are together, the spoons are together. So all I have to do is lift that basket out, grab them all at once and dump them into the right cubby hole instead of having to pull these things out item by item and sort as I go. Same thing with plates and bowls and other items. And then those odd one or two off items that you might come up with, you could just put those anywhere. It is amazing how much time something as simple as just sorting on the way in instead of sorting on the way out might be. And Steve Jones, you can always tell a great BA because he said, I thought everyone just always put like items together. Well, sadly, most people don't have the BA superpower. And <laughs> even when I've taught people this lesson, let's say even in the same household, it's not always done that way. Uh, so there's some rearranging that might be done as we go along. So those are two. Uh, so that's one of the first easy hacks for a dishwasher. Amy, what's a hack that you'd like to share? Well, I don't know very many hacks. I'm kind of the slack on this show because I am the world's worst housekeeper. But I do have a few. Um, some work really, really well. And as Hans and I found out today, others Maybe not so much, but my first one, which <laughs> which does work very, very well, and I'm going to demonstrate it as best I can, is cleaning silverware. So um, everyone knows silver polish, silver cleaner stinks, like horrible, like cow field, bad. But um, so I have discovered this hack uh, via my mother, Carol, taught me this one. And um, it works like a charm. So what you do is you get a glass Pyrex dish. It has to be glass. And you line it with tinfoil. Shiny side up. Now you take your sad looking uh, silver pieces, like this lovely necklace or bracelet, for example, that my mom gave me, or this ring that's a little tarnished. And you set it in there. And then you cover it with baking soda. Cover it, cover it, cover it. Boom, 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 boom. Or sorry, yep, baking soda. Everyone has this stuck in the back of their fridge. And then you pour boiling water over it and let it sit. So I'm going to go do that off camera now. And then we're going to come back later on and check it. My, my sparkling jewelry is all clean. We'll check, back in and see, we'll check back in and see how this recipe turns out. Over to you, Hans. <laughs> that is wonderful. All right. So another one is uh, built on the principle of Ohio. And Ohio here means not the state and certainly not Ohio State, but the only handle it wants. And so one of the challenges that we have, especially dealing with play, paperwork, bills, is how many times do we pick them up, look at them, put them down, sort them, resort them, and then it ends up causing conflict. So we imp implemented a simple process to do that. So here on the counter, we have a colorful blue flower basket 
that was picked out by the decorating portion of the family, put out so that it would look nice. And all new mail goes in there. Doesn't matter what it is, you just throw it all in. And then at least once a week, you go through the entire stack and deal with it. Everything, you have to deal with it the first time. So the first thing you do is you open up everything. You recycle and trash everything you can after marking out your address, if you do that. Anything that is a bill or a follow-up item, put in a stack, and you're going to deal with that immediately, not put it off and risk being late. Anything you can file, file. On the right-hand side of the picture, you see a small white box. This is actually a rolling file cabinet. So in that file cabinet, we have folders for all of our different types of paperwork, home and house and utilities, uh, bills, medical and insurance, work-related items. And so as we pull items out, they all go to, you file directly into the filing cabinet and it's all done. To reduce your bills even further, if you can do this and be financially responsible, it's really great to pay all of your bills by credit card. So go ahead and pay them. Uh, and then all you have to do is pay that one credit card bill. So every bill we have, we set up on credit card billing. We pay off the credit card bill every single month. If you can't do that, don't, because you don't want to pay 18 to 28% interest on your bills. But if you can pay the bill off reliably and on time, having most of your bills only appear as a credit charge is very helpful. So Amy, when it comes to your bills and paperwork, are you using an Ohio principle or do you fall victim to the keep picking it up and, oh, I'll deal it with deal with that later? What do you think? I think you're responsible. Oh, look, shiny things. So you can see, <laughs> I'm just taking that out. I don't know if you saw that before, but that was all tarnished and now it is sparkly and lovely. That is amazing. Yep, that's right. <laughs> it's a great little hat. Unfortunately, Michael, part of the Ohio principle does not include being able to send all your bills to me to pay off, <laughs> although that would be the simplest if we could do that. You know, I make fun of myself um, for my lack of organization and things like that, but um, I'm looking at something Steve Jones wrote in there, but at the grocery store, and I actually do do this. I'm very particular when I'm putting things on the conveyor, put all my produce together. I put everything together that I know goes together in my house. So I know this is going in that cupboard, that's going in that cupboard, these things are going here, that's going in the crisper, and that's how I load the conveyor belt. When, but when I see the, the, when they're bagging it, if they're not putting them in the order that I place them on a belt, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I start rearranging in the bag, but it's great. Like I, I saves you tons of, times on, uh, ton, tons of time on loading your bags. So good one, Steve. Yep, love that. I, I do a modified version of that. When I'm going to a place that has self-checkout, especially if it has a hand scanner, I put all the items into the bag sorted with the barcodes facing up. So I just take the little zapper gun and scan the barcodes, and I can clear probably four to six times as many items uh, as people who do it the traditional way. Mm -hmm. if, um, if I have to put it on the conveyor belt, I actually put it based on that how I want them to bag using mm -hmm. my recycled bags, which means the heaviest or the blockiest items first, yeah. because there's less chance that they're going to break it. And what happens is if there's a soft item or item that they don't think will fit in the middle, they end up putting it in and then look at the bag and can't figure out how to put everything else in. So yeah. I save them the mental games and just go <laughs> ahead and sort that for them. <laughs> I too also put my stuff on the belt with the, um, the code, the, because uh, I worked in retail when I was in college in a card store. And so, you know, people would hand you a stack of cards and you had to flip them over, scan them, flip them over. So what I, what I learned from that job was to always make things as easy for the person who's processing your order as possible and always have the SKUs facing up. Just a little thing. The next one I'm going to share is actually a two-part hack. And that is, do you ever hate it when you run out of soap, run out of shampoo, <laughs> in the shower and then it's like okay do i use the wrong product or get by or do i just get out dripping wet drip water all over the carpet and floor to go get it and so the simplest if you uh, solution here if you've got space is put your backup item in the shower with you so here there's a backup can of shaving cream there's a backup face scrub uh, behind the face scrub there's a backup uh soap 
And so everything that's needed, there's at least one backup. So I will never run out and never have to leave the shower if that happens. <laughs> now, as some of you are already saying, it's like, wow, have you seen a clinical psychologist for some of your issues? The answer is yes at one time, but I probably <laughs> am overdue to go back. And I would say I suffer from mild OCD and it is certainly not debilitating. <laughs> well, no, I like that one because I remember once going to a wedding with a friend and we were sharing a hotel room and they, you know, you get the little mini bottles of shampoo in there. I don't know why they deemed it necessary to wash their hair twice a day, but there was none left for me to wash my hair with hand soap. <laughs> Yes. And I was flying to, for, to Vancouver for the uh, Vancouver event that day. It was not fun. So, yeah, back up. Always good. I have a hack. All right. Let's uh, <laughs> let me uh, go ahead. I'll leave the pictures up, but go ahead. Oh, no, you yours has booze in it. You go first. Yours is way more interesting. <laughs> All right. Then we'll come to the Amy hack. <laughs> so the other thing is on a similar principle, which is, you know, we all, well, some of us were really surprised when the lockdown hit. Or especially, you know, Amy being in Canada, you all are doing a rolling rolling lockdown, which I, it would drive me insane. Like I'm it's bad enough lockdown. being in the states. So one of the challenges is what happens when you run out of stuff, especially booze. Where your budget allows, figure out the items you routinely buy, and when you go shopping, just add one more item. So in this case, we eat a lot of peanut butter. So last time I went to Lidl. They had it on sale, and I went ahead and bought a couple extra jars. I put them on a shelf, and then if we start to run low, I pull one of the backups forward. This is especially true with alcohol for those of you who consume or imbibe or other drinks. So in this case, we have I have a shelf in my basement that is my backup alcohol. So we have we call this the emergency wine stash. Uh, there's tequila for margaritas and triple sec. And not shown here uh, is beer, but the beer, because it does spoil, um, we cycle through in, in less things. So just think about the items, the pastas, the sauce, your favorite salad dressing, whatever it is you get. And just instead of buying one, buy two. When it starts to get empty, refresh that the spare, not the regular one. And unless you just don't remember, you'll very rarely run out of anything. That's a good one. Amy, you've got a wonderful hack for us. I do have a wonderful hack. And it's just, you know, this is just, an, it's okay. So I'm going to try and demonstrate it as best I can. But it's about like when you get scratches in wood, um, be it your floors, ta wooden table, what have you. Um, I found another that my mother, again, Carol's very wise, not just a beautiful face, walnuts. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. If you have, um, I tried to make a, a bit of a, a mar on this so you could see. Just taking a regular walnut, you don't want like the candied ones or anything, and you just like buff the wood with the walnut and it like, it shines right up and it completely like gets rid of the, 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 uh, the ding or the scratch. It's really very cool. So you should always keep walnuts at home. Not only are they healthy for snacking, but also for repairing dings and such in your wooden furniture and floors. Back that, to you, Hans. That is amazing. And it really does work. Make does. sure that you do shell the walnuts first. This is yeah. the walnut part, not the shell, or you might scratch something worse. Right. And you probably want to break the walnut in half or something so you get an, the the meaty part in the center to, to buffer <laughs> your things with. But yeah, no, it's that's that's a great little hack. And I only learned that one as of late too. Um, but I've used it many, many times. And there's a lot of wonderful YouTube channels and articles out there with crazy hacks and home detergents and stuff. So, you know, we're not going to pilfer from their list. Our goal here is to try and share ones that are just, they're so simple they couldn't possibly work, but yeah. yet they do. The next one I don't have a visual for because we don't need one, and that is dealing with the problem of our garbage cans. So one of the challenges you have is do if you don't want to take out the bag before or it's really full, but then by the time you take it out, it's probably <laughs> too full, and you pull it out and things might fall out, the bag's about to split, yep. uh, it's hard to close. All you have to do is buy garbage bags that are one size bigger than your container, and as you lift it out, it'll have plenty to wrap up and around the top, pull out, 
and then you can seal it. Sometimes you can tie it in a knot depending on how full it is. And typically the larger size garbage bags are a little stronger than their smaller size counterparts. So it's less likely to tear. So if you think about a tall kitchen garbage can that's normally a 40 ga uh, uh, 20 gallon, buy the 33 gallon outdoor garbage bags for them. If you're worried about what it looks like, they do offer them in clear or white or other colors. And the same thing, if you're doing, doing a medium, put a tall in it. If you've got a tiny, put a medium in it. And you never run out of space and it very rarely punctures unless you just happen to put in a sharp item that cuts it on the way in. That's a good one. And I'm very guilty of that as well, winding up with, you know, all sorts of things on the kitchen floor. <laughs> yeah. So, Amy, yes. somebody sent you beautiful flowers. No, I I bought them for myself, Hans. Yes. <laughs> and somebody I wonderful yourself sent them to yourself. I know, that's right. So, I love tulips. My absolute favorite tulip season's coming to a close, which makes me very sad. But years ago, when I was in high school, I used to uh, watch As the World Turns. And halfway through As the World Turns, this guy came on called Graham Handy with Han Haley's Handy Hints. Graham Haley, Haley's Handy Hints. And he taught us on something that if you want to um, extend the life of your tulips and also perk them up, put two pennies in the vase for whatever reason. And he didn't know the answer. It works. So we, knowing that we were doing this show yesterday, it was an excuse for me to go down to the, the local market and buy myself some tulips. So I sent you the picture of what they looked like then. Because the big reveal was going to be how fabulous they looked today after they sat with the pennies. And unfortunately, this falls under epic fail. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but my, my poor tulips didn't perk up. But usually they like stand straight up. So I don't know. Maybe I got a bad batch. I'm not sure what. But this is the only time it hasn't worked. But I tell you, if you have fresh cut tulips, always put pennies in the water. Works like a charm, usually. And Except actually, today you're going to broadcast broadcast this as being like a, a handy hack. Well, and it actually did work. So you can see from the picture we're displaying now, well, that was in the story. morning, they were all droopy like they are now. Amy put a penny in, and then later that night, they had perked up and they were beautiful. The key here is it's, it's a copper penny. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it needs to be an older penny, depending, because they did change the material in them. And it did. They perked up. So the more copper you put in, the more it perks up. Yep. Um, I was Googling this earlier. I did not see the exact reason why it works. But um, this does work with many flowers and tulips mm -hmm. in particular. Yep, it's true. Um, in Canada, we uh, don't produce pennies anymore. So I have, I have my stash of pennies that I save. <laughs> just for this reason. And it does, it works like a charm. It's, it's, it's like magic. That is excellent. That was one that I had not heard before, but I have shared it with a lot of people already. Yeah, it's a good one. Well, for our next one, you know, uh, who doesn't run out of space? And especially for uh, our Canadian friends or friends in big cities that live in apartments, space is a premium. And if you look at some of the city living, some of the Ikea furniture, furniture that's in Asia and Europe, they're used to making the most. And we can actually do the same thing here. And so in this case, what we're looking at is over any doorway, if you get an L bracket, a triangle bracket, screw it into the uh, studs. You need to put it into the studs because you don't want it to reach out. And then you could put a board, a wire shelf, above the area of the of the door frame and you can use that to store and stack stuff all the way to the ceiling the second piece is the corner brackets that i put in this is actually in our laundry room it i also put a hanging bar across it so i bought one that is an angle hook but it also has a loop for a closet bar and that way, when I'm taking clothes, uh, dress clothes, T-shirts out of the dryer, I can hang them up immediately and carry them on hangers back to the bedroom. So this simple place added, you know, a couple cubic feet of extra storage space and more importantly, a great place to hang and dry clothes. The counter to that is you could even do the same exact same thing over a window. 
if I can find the picture, here's the window. And so on the opposite wall in the laundry room, we've got a hanging basket for other clothes and things. And I use a similar, just this one's just a hanging bar. I don't have a shelf on it, but I use that for jackets. And the idea here is why would I keep jackets or socks and shoes in a bedroom or somewhere when I'm going to be going out through the garage door every time? So what I did instead was I moved my shoes onto a shelf in the laundry room. All the socks are in there so I can grab the socks and shoes and go. And then hanging up are the coats. Uh, it's full during the winter. And then I move them into a spare closet in the summer just to clear space and open up the window a little bit. So just look for places where maybe you, it looks like you've got dead wall space. And how often do you really want to look through the window in a laundry room? So in this case, covering it up with coats was no problem at all. So Amy, do you have another hack you'd like no, to No, I told you. I'm the worst, <laughs> worst housekeeper. That's it. You got it all. Well, I think w one of the tributes to your housekeeping, since it's not something you enjoy, is you keep things very organized and very simple. Yes. Um, like once it's decorated, once it's in place, it's there and you leave it alone. So you've taken out so much of the maintenance. You're not moving things around. You're not constantly having to clean. You're not causing all sorts of chaos because everything has its place. It's there. So yeah. other than the kitchen or, you know, places where you're actively working, everything stays perfect with very little maintenance. And that is a tremendous time saver. No. Well, and I'm not working with a lot of space, right? I live downtown uh, Toronto. So I have probably maybe 875 square feet, maybe, including my balcony. It's being, so I don't have a lot of room. So when there is clutter and stuff, it's so obvious and it's, and it drives me absolutely bonkers. I'll have, I'll throw it all in a cupboard so I don't have to see it, but I don't <laughs> like seeing it. So it looks very, you know, pleasing aesthetically, but, uh, you know, open a drawer and, or a closet, boy, oh boy, make sure you have a hard hat on. <laughs> Well, and, and as you can see from Amy's background, and it's not virtual, is when you're dealing with uh, when you're dealing with a smaller space, and especially when we're dealing with you know a background that we have to use because we're on video calls all day, for a small space, leaving white space, leaving room, keeping it simple and not cluttered. Like when you look at the back of B, it's cluttered. It's it's a little overwhelming. Um, I did it because there was a lot that I wanted to throw up and I was getting bored, but now I, I'm starting to go through and simplify it. So keep things simple and you reduce the maintenance that's involved uh, as well. And as Steve points out, be purposeful with your purchases, yeah. you know, save money by not buying junk or things that are just going to clutter because then if you try and declutter, it's either give it away or put it into one of those dangerous closets that has been probably featured on Final Destination. <laughs> so the next little hack is great. Uh, we're about to hit summer picnic time. Hopefully as everyone uh, goes out and gets vaccinated, really encourage everyone to do so unless they are told by their doctor to reconsider, um, definitely go out. And one of the challenges we have is how do you keep things cold in your cooler? A lot of times we might buy bagged ice and dump it in, and then we get a sloshy mess at the end. Or what we do is we buy the reusable ice packs. The reusable ice packs are really cool, but you have to store them in the freezer and keep them stored. When they melt, you're now carrying this empty lug. Yep. So a hack that I actually learned when I was traveling a lot, because I can't fly with these ice packs, but I wanted to have, like, I have a little collapsible cooler I could take on site with me, was to bring Ziploc bags. And if you fill up a, uh, if you fill up a freezer bag with water, lay it flat with, a, you don't want to fill it completely full because ice does expand and you don't want it to split, but fill it mostly full with water lay it flat in the freezer. Even a hotel freezer is often enough to, to freeze it. Or if you've got an efficiency, you can do this as home as well. And then put it in your freezer to freeze, put it in a second bag just to make sure that it doesn't pop open or leak. In your cooler that serves as an ice pack and it's as good as carrying ice. It's completely free except for the Ziploc bags. And then if you want water, 
during your trip, you can pour the water out of the bag and it's perfectly safe to drink. So you're ending up Ooh. triple purposing. Plus, if you have a mess or a trash at the end, you could use the Ziploc bags to package up anything that's spilled, any trash you have, anything that you might have opened but didn't finish. And you don't want to throw, you know, a open container of potato salad back in your cooler and risk it tipping over when you get home. So Ziploc bags make great ice packs. It's a good one. <laughs> um, another one is, uh, you know, some, some people really like having fresh food and they cook fresh each meal. That's great. Uh, it is even easier when we get to go to the market and can pick up whatever we're in the mood for. If you are cooking for the week or cooking in bulk, instead of putting all of your food into large containers and then scooping out and reserving, why not put it into smaller single serving size? So you can just reach in, pull that serving out like pasta. It's already got the sauce on it. Pop it in the microwave. You're good to go. Top it with your favorite uh, high grade Parmesan or uh, uh, Romano cheese. Mm, so good. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, dishing, cutting things apart or heating and reheating the whole thing, everyone. So again, thinking about how it's going to be used at the end rather than how you're putting it away or organizing at the beginning can really help. Yeah, I do that now when I buy chicken and stuff, because, you know, I usually get them in like the four or five pack. And I used to just like fling the whole thing in the freezer. Then when you want it, you have to defrost all of them. Are you going to be using all five? Chances are you're not if you're especially, you know, a single person living alone. So now I purposely, when I get them home, I bag them in Ziploc bags and boom, 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 throw them in the freezer like that. Well, as we went through some of the different phases and peaks in COVID, I made that mistake twice. I bought one of the big family packs of chicken going, all right, yeah. if, they, if they end up cutting the processing plants, either we won't be able to get it or the price is going to be sky high. Mm -hmm. we'll go ahead and buy it while it's still cheap. And so the first thing I did was I pulled it out of the cheap container. I put it in a giant Ziploc bag, threw it in the freezer. And then about a day later, I was like, that was a big mistake. I now have to defrost seven, uh, uh, 12 chicken breasts and cook them all at once or yep. refreeze them or cut them apart. So after that, I started putting, uh, started freezing things in cooking size. So two small steaks, two chicken breasts, uh, two to four thighs. Because what happens if you're cooking for more, you want to cook more, you just take two packages yep. out. You're really not wasting that much freezer paper or Ziploc bags, whatever you happen to use. Mm -hmm. We are not sponsored nor endorsed by Ziploc bags. So if you would like to use Glad bags or any generic, uh, feel free. Uh, just <laughs> kind of like making a Xerox for a copy. It's just it and Kleenex. They're just a bag is a Ziploc. <laughs> they're actually, they have really, really uh, good quality ones for people who live in Canada, Dollarama, that's where I get mine. They actually have like the little zipper so you don't have to like try and like squeeze the blue strip with the pink strip and hope it seals. I like the little zipper, it's awesome. And they're like a buck 50 for like a big bag of them. So they're good ones. Love those things, yep. Uh, I'm and admiring so my new shiny jewelry. Woohoo! Yep, that, see, it worked. I don't know if you can see, but they're sparkly, sparkly, sparkly now. Better living through chemistries. That's right. Aluminum foil and baking soda, things you should have on hand anyway. Oh, this way. Works like a charm. And the box has two sides. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. So the next one may come as a little bit of a surprise to some of you. Because when you're vacuuming, you're probably used to dumping out the container. In the old days, we dumped out the vacuum bag. But a lot of them now have a container that you dump. Did you know that almost all new vacuum cleaners have two sets of filters that have to be cleaned also? There's a HEPA filter, which has to be replaced, so by replacements. And there is also probably a sponge filter or a two-layer sponge filter in it as well. And what happens is the air pulls through the sponge and takes the big debris out and then it goes through the second one before it releases the air back in. So it uses the canister to catch most of it. This catches the 
other dust. And then the fine one prevents the basically the allergens and the fine dust from getting back out in the air. And then the last step is it goes through the HEPA filter. Because if not, it's like taking a leaf blower in your living room and you're just scaring up dust everywhere. Yeah. So one of the keys is if you buy the replacement, even if you buy generic ones, what you could do when you're done vacuuming is if it's dirty, if it looks gray or nasty or caked up, take the old one out, put the replacement in, and you're good to go vacuuming again. Next, take this to your kitchen, to your wastebasket, brush off all the garbage and stuff you can, get as much of the large particulate off, and then wash it with dish soap and water. So get it wet, put dish soap on, basically treat it like a sponge. The soap will bond to the dirt and dust and help pull it out. And then just continue to rinse it until the water runs clear. Now you can set these out to dry until the next time you need to swap them. That way you don't ever vacuum, forgetting to put the filters back in. Usually these things are a buck or two, uh, uh, especially if you buy a bulk pack. And then I would say at least once to twice a year, check the help HEPA filter. If it's white or nearly white, keep it. If it is gray, get rid of it. If it is black, check it more often. Mm. Yep. I actually, uh, we had a friend who uh, called and wanted to know if I had a recommendation for small vacuum cleaners for her apartment because her stopped working. And I was like, sure, you know, I can help that. But why don't you bring it over? I actually am pretty decent at fixing stuff. Maybe I could do this. So she brought it over, looked, she had dumped out the canister, and then I pulled out the extra filter. And I was like, did you, have you ever cleaned this? And she's like, what is that? It's, like, well, <laughs> it's kind of like that tray underneath the refrigerator that everyone is surprised exists. And by simply cleaning that filter, the airflow went through. And so she was not getting any suction before. And by simply cleaning the filter, she had a brand new vacuum with no trouble. Can we just uh, skip back for a second? What, what tray under the refrigerator? <laughs> <laughs> I immediately looked over. It's obviously over there. I'm like, okay. So it's supposed to come out of there because I've been here for 14 years and it never has. <laughs> and I'm not joking and I'm very embarrassed for myself right now. So along the bottom of the fridge, yes. it may vary by model, there is a little plastic snap on that looks like the air vent to the front of your car. Yes, I see that, it. That will just snap straight off. Your fridge may have a tray or a pan that pulls out. So the fridge circulates air yes. to help cool the coils and the tray collects a lot of the gunk or anything that drains out of the fridge. Like if you have a spill and it over drain and it drains out into that pan. So you can pull that out and wash and clean it if you need it. That will also help keep your coils less dirty. So whether it's underneath or on the back, if your coils are dirty, you want to take a brush and a vacuum and get those off because your fridge isn't working efficiently and you're probably wasting a lot of money. And well, I've never done it. Would you like me to pull mine out and show everybody out in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> I will not do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of frightened to see what's under there, but it's something I'm going to do when we get off the call. Yeah. And as Steve mentions, yes, yes, it's very similar to the tray that's in the bottom of your toaster oven. So if you're now going, wait a minute, there's a tray in the bottom of my toaster oven. Yeah. The bottom of the toaster oven is not part of it. It's actually a tray, usually a flat piece of metal that pulls out and it picks up all the crumbs, the drippings, the cheese that fell off your bread or, or whatever. And yes, that should be cleaned a little bit more often so that you don't accidentally start a toaster fire. No. Good call. A little, little different than a dumpster fire, much smaller, <laughs> but still not desirable. <laughs> Listen, I didn't even know the baskets were removable from a dishwasher from your first hack. So um, I've learned a lot today. Well, the new ones are. Some of the old ones were are snapped in. You can remove them and replace them. But yeah. some of them are designed with a little hook so they slide in and out. And it's just so much easier. I, I pull it out. I used to just do it in the dishwasher door, mm -hmm. but it's so easy to pull it out, do it on the counter, and put everything away. No, it's probably better for your back too. Yes. Right? Yeah. We have to think about these things as as we as we move forward in life. 
not planning ahead is a failure to plan or no. What was the correct quote? <laughs> oh, pl not planning ahead is planning to fail. Oh uh, yeah, not remembering things also goes up on my list as well. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, and this one actually raised some eyebrows when I started doing it, is you know how the toilet paper roll starts to get low? Yes. And most of us probably keep some spare rolls within reach, probably under the sink in a cabinet or something like that. But it still could be a little inconvenient if you have to get up, uh, except for in between cycles. Or the worst thing is you think you have spare toilet paper there, but it's really in but the hall closet don't. instead. <laughs> so what I always do is as you start getting down to the bottom of the roll, go ahead and grab the next roll and set it on the back, of, either set it on your garbage can, the sink, the back of your toilet, someplace that's easy to reach. That way, as it runs out, you already have the next roll ready to go and you never have to worry about running out. Do you remember back in the 70s, I think everyone's um, aunt or Nana had one of those toilet paper roll covers on the, on the back of the toilet that was like a Barbie torso. And then the skirt was a big crochet thing that went over the toilet paper roll. I did not. We did not have one of those. You don't remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, actually. Oh, ever, everyone had them. It was quite all the rage in like the mid to late 70s. I'll send you a picture of it. Yeah, it was like a Barbie torso with a crocheted or knitted skirt. And the knitted skirt went over the toilet paper roll. And everyone had them in their bathrooms. <laughs> well, you are correct. Uh, so Steve definitely remembers that. He remembers well. them. <laughs> yep. You well, not, it like church bazaars and things like that. And I wish, honestly, they would make a resurgence because I would love to get my hands on one. If anyone out there makes them. Well, and I was from Minneapolis. So chances are, and, and part my mom's family actually grew up on a farm. So you'd think we would have seen that. Yeah. I don't think we ever had one. But I know my babysitter did and my and my nana definitely did. But anyways, what more hacks, more hacks. <laughs> okay, so the next one is gonna be a, a kind of a two part. So the first thing is we all have electronic calendars now, probably through our, you know, and I'd recommend doing this on your personal calendar through Yahoo, Gmail, Apple, whatever you happen to use, but use your calendar and put in reminders or recurring events when you have subscriptions that are gonna be due, um, reminders. So for example, I have a quarterly reminder to change my air filters on my furnaces. Yes, yeah. the air filters on your furnace need to be changed. So you wanna do that probably, depending on the filters you have every one to three months. Uh, some of them can go as long as six months, but the more dirtier they get, the worse your system runs and more, more likely it is to break. And they are very expensive to fix or replace. So put reminders like, when does my internet contract or TV service renew? When does my cell phone contract expire? What about certain memberships? In this way, you can get a reminder one week or two weeks together, which ties into the second part of this trick. <clears throat> and that is, if you are if you're receiving a promotional credit, it probably is going to expire when you try and renew and it's gonna bump up to full price. Some people take whatever little promo that they offer and say, okay, I'll renew, but I won't get my same bonus. If you call in and, and when you get to the call in number, go to cancel service, the cancellation desk has authority to make deeper discounts than the regular service desk. Really? Yes. So you go to the cancel desk and you say, I love my service, but it, without the promo, it's going to be too expensive. I think I need to cancel. If there's any way you can renew my promo, I'd like to stay, but I, I'm, you know, that might not be possible. And depending on the company, sometimes they will offer uh, lower discounts. And then you have to say, no, I really needed to keep to an example. So I'm gonna use one example. So when I purchased a car, it came with a certain, we'll just say streaming ad-free radio service attached to it. And I was paying as part of the promo after the first free six months, $5 a month for their entire package. The renewal rate was $50 a month. 
it wasn't worth $50 a month. So I called to cancel. And when I did, they're like, well, we can move you to a lower package if you want to save. And I said, actually, there's only a couple channels I really listen to. So like, I really just don't see the value. I was willing to pay $5 a month, but I'm not willing to pay 50. Well, they're like, okay, what if we could give you that same package for $20 a month? And I was like, $20 is better, but honestly, I, I rarely listen to it. Um, uh, no. And they're like, well, there's a special promo. How about nine ninety five? And I'm like, honestly, I was like, it, it's okay. I, I know you can't, you know, going from 50 down to five, is it reasonable? That's okay. And they're like, well, let me check. Hey, I found a special promo that we are allowed to offer for you since you had this package before. We can continue your service for $5. I've been using that same service now for 12 years wow. at $5 a month. And every year when it comes due, I call the cancellation desk. I used to have to fight with them, but apparently they've just decided it's not worth their time. So when I call in and say, hey, if you can keep me at $5 a month or just $5 a month to give me these three channels I listen to, I'll keep it. And every time they're like, okay, we can renew. It'll be $5 a month. Here's the total. We have to charge tax. So it works out to be a little bit more. And I get to keep the service. Uh, that works with uh, cable and internet and TV. Sometimes better than others. Uh, when I was with one cable provider, it would always go up a couple bucks, but with a hundred, you know, we had a combined internet and phone bill. So going up $5 on a hundred, $125 bill wasn't extreme. It was annoying. When I switched to another provider, we're getting internet access now for $50 and they immediately said, yeah, we'll keep you at $50, no problem. And so I've kept that. So you could save a lot of money by simply talking to the cancellation desk and then at to, uh, and then working through, if they can't hit a price, all you, and you but you don't really want to cancel. Don't worry. All you do at the end because they have to confirm with you is say, "Well, let me think it over. What was that lowest price again?" Okay, I'll call back. Do I call you or talk to someone else? And then you can try the same thing with someone else. And if you say, all right, they're not going to give me $5, but they're going to give me seven and seven is acceptable. Then you know, that really is the best rate. Cool beans. I sent you um, a, a little uh, message just now, but I, I found, I don't know if you can see this. Yes. There, there she is. That's the toilet paper lady. Those are adorable. Oh, absolutely. 100%. So. Now you have another copy. <laughs> I'll, I'll send that to my niece. She's a talented knitter and crocheter, and uh, that's pretty cool. Oh, we could give them as door prizes at, at BA World. That would be great. <laughs> we could we could tie it something to um, how to hide how you cope with your boss. <laughs> okay, do we have time for a few more, or how are we doing? I think we're good, but I think, you know, there's, a, we can close out with, uh, I'll close out with one more on I, my okay. end. And this one really is, is tied to saving money. And we've all heard that if you turn your thermostat a little bit higher in the summer, a little colder in the winter, you can save money. We actually, and I apologize, I meant to get the Celsius conversions and I forgot to do it in time, but during the summer, after we had a, we live in Atlanta, it gets hot here. It doesn't really get that cold, but our heating and cooling bill, our electric and gas bill w was getting astronomical. It was just horrific. So we ended up and during the summer, we keep, uh, I would recommend keeping your thermostat at 78 to 80. We actually keep ours at 82, which I don't like, but my wife is cold natured and she wins. <laughs> And in the winter, we keep it, uh, you know, they recommend keeping it around 68 or below 66, 68 Fahrenheit. We actually keep ours at 62. Now, how do you tolerate that heat and cold? Well, in the winter, we have a heating blanket underneath the couch where my wife sits. So all she does is turn it on and she's sit sitting on a heated seat, kind of like some of the fancy cars. That keeps her plenty warm enough with a blanket over the top. 
and I don't mind as much. In the summer, we use ceiling fans, or I've got a little $8 fan from Walmart that I place in front of my chair blowing air on me, and I feel fine. It has cut our power bill in half. Wow. And that was significant. Like that was, it went from being painful to being just a little bit annoying. Wow. Um, so consider cl closing off rooms and vents where you, if you don't ever use them, but you know, look at your power bill and see if you, you know, try it for a month, try it for two months, set it for a, you know, right at that edge of comfort and see if you can tolerate it and see what a difference it makes in your bill. That's just easy money to save, especially after we start going back to work or doing things outside and we're just not at home as well. And as Steve says, absolutely wearing uh, appropriate <laughs> clothes to begin with is certainly, uh, certainly a good way to go. <laughs> oh, Steve Jones, you card. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Any parting thoughts, parting advice? So let's let's end because we said Slack. What is let's let's end each with one just totally slacker thing that that we do in at the home. Might be better, but it's Slack and it works. Gosh. So you I'll start with one. You start. Um, so I don't. Uh, I vacuum once a week in our family room. We I don't like pulling gone. out. Yep. I don't like dusting or uh, or sweeping or vacuuming the kitchen. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll grab the broom and I'll just sweep everything into a corner right under the edge of the cabinet. And I'll do that for a couple weeks. And then I'll finally go pull out the vacuum and vacuum up the big pile of dog hair <laughs> and everything else that hit the floor. <laughs> just so I don't have to pull the vacuum out and go uh, uh, sweeper and go out into the kitchen. <laughs> we both I would I was saying we have something in common we both recently discovered that we uh every time we vacuum we vacuum to a queen song same queen song yes I've got how can you not vacuum to I want to be free I want to break free <laughs> always always without fail that was funny how long have I known you and we just discovered that like three weeks ago or something I, I, I <laughs> It just at one day I was like, if I'm gonna have to vacuum, why wouldn't I have fun? So, turn, you know, I tell one of our smart devices, or I pull it up on the TV, blast it out, and you know, do my horrible attempt at a two-step while I'm vacuuming. The dogs think I'm crazy. I can't deny that. I'm sane, <laughs> but it seems to work out all right. That's funny. Well, this has been fun. I learned a lot. <laughs> well, I appreciate uh, you uh, being a part of this, helping with the planning and joining today. Uh, you know, Amy, why don't you, you know, we've got a lot of great listeners out there and hopefully people will be picking this up on the replay as well. You have some amazing events <gasps> in the conference space coming up. Tell us about it. And where would people go to find out more? Steve Jones, who's been uh, uh, active commenting, will be speaking as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. So give us a little preview of little what we have preview. coming. The what rest we have of the year. coming up. Well, coming up on Tuesday, we have our second annual uh, project management business analysis virtual global virtual co virtual conference, which you will be speaking at. And um, it's the only event that we're doing spring of this year usually we have you know about four or five running but obviously because of stuff stuff going on we can't but the exciting news is is that we're going to be launching our in-person events again in the u.s for now um things are really opening up there i think every person i know who lives in the united states have had both their their vaccines in canada were a little behind um with the rollout and stuff but by the time you know september rolls around we'll be done so yeah we're running an event in Orlando, start September 8th to 10th, which is gonna be fantastic, great program. Uh, we're gonna be hitting Boston. Steve Jones is gonna be speaking at that one. He's on our advisory board there. Washington, DC, which is a great city to visit and um, Chicago. So people can find out everything by visiting pmbaconferences.com. That's PM, Project Management, BA, Business Analysis Conferences.com. So we have the whole roster up there and the dates and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to getting to traveling again. Fantastic. And it's it's long overdue. If you've if you've ever wanted to go to, you know, definitely check out the virtual conference. Time to get involved in that. And the fall events are going to be amazing. Yeah. Um the the speaker lineup, the topics, 
you know, the, the hardest part is deciding which session to go to, or, you know, do you hang out and visit with people because you're learning so much at the breaks, but definitely yeah. check those out. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone again in person yes. and uh, hopefully uh, everyone will be fully vaccinated and we'll have this thing pretty well curtailed except for the COVID idiots and we're just going <laughs> to ignore them and keep ourselves safe. So Amy, thanks again. It Thank is you. always wonderful to see and talk to you. Look forward to having you on another show in the near future. I hope so. Everyone, please hope you can also cut off early this Friday as we have and enjoy hopefully either a long weekend in Canada this weekend yeah. or a long weekend next weekend in the States or I believe in uh, celebrating both companies, oh. so, um, countries, so I'm going to be taking both holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Have a, Stay safe and we'll see you on another broadcast. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Happy